Hello, my name is Ruby Almeida, and I'm really thrilled and honored to be here for the Gathering Voices event on Embracing Diversity. So I'm here to attempt to address this thorny question on what LGBTQIA women feel. Um, and to be more specific, what do I feel about the complicated landscape that our diverse communities inhabit? So let me start with a little bit of background about me. So India is the land of my birth, and I've never renounced, renounced my citizenship or Indian identity. And you know, us Indians, we get everywhere. The Indian diaspora is massive and is a global phenomenon. We make a mark on society wherever we locate ourselves in all walks of life. And I know there are many Indian Catholics who struggle to come out about their sexuality. Their close-knit Asian communities are bound by tradition, albeit all aligned with more recent Western colonial uh, dictates. Uh, and all the more so because of their diaspora, diaspora situation, it is a problem. Parents misguidedly feel compelled to keep their culture and traditions alive, almost in a fossilized state, by imposing values that perhaps are not so closely adhered to uh, back home in their own land of birth. And they impose those values and traditions on their children who are most likely not born there or perhaps left when they were very, very young. So there are generations that are caught up between two very competing cultures. Those parents of LGBT plus children who have a faith turn to and uh, adhere to the sometimes very harmful church narratives on homosexuality as an indication that their child has fallen victim to Western values and has rejected their own cultural and heritage values. Now, my sexuality, my gender, and certainly my ethnicity was never an issue. In fact, all of them were much respected and celebrated in the world of education and media that I inhabited. And yet, when I entered into the LGBT world of faith, that is where the difficulties started to manifest themselves. Almost always, I was the only woman there, something that didn't faze me. In fact, it seemed to be the norm, as I was invariably always own, the only woman, the only non-white person, the only non-English person, the only whatever in most spheres that I entered. Quite naturally, by then, I was of a certain age, in my fourth decade, actually. And I was used to holding leadership roles. So being visible, having a voice, did not always go down well with some of the more established gay men in the various organizations that I engaged with. I suspect many saw me as a threat to their comfortable, familiar gentlemen's club that they had created and felt was theirs exclusively. I'm sure many hoped that like all the other women who had previously come along, that I would leave pretty sharpish. But thanks to some, actually, there were quite a few men, good men, who would warmly welcome me and wish to collaborate with me. So now being part of a community that has been criminalized, victimized, and continually marginalized, you would think and hope that there would be a strong bond of alliance and collegiality within the LGBT sphere. Sadly, that was not the case in my experience of living in the West. The marginalized jostle for position to be at the head of the pecking order and do a rather fine, if often subtle job of marginalizing those within their own community. There's an acute sense of entitlement by those who feel that because society treated them badly, they deserve to have the limelight and to hold on to the channels of communication. The idea that the oppressed can become the oppressor is just never entertained. So how do we address the thorny question of inequalities of gender, sexuality, and ethnicity within our own communities? 
how do we create a genuine sense of solidarity and that of a radical forward thinking and inclusive community? In the Diocese of Westminster, at the Farm Street Catholic Church, there is a fortnightly mass that I've supported right from the start. In fact, I attended a mass that was trialed by the then Cardinal Cormac Murphy, Archbishop of Westminster, at a backwater parish called Blessed Sacrament. The priest there, Father Jim Kennedy, had a very warm and open, welcoming uh, attitude towards the LGBT people who attended the mass. He made us an integral part of the parish uh, and we were there to celebrate his silver jubilee. When the community there and those who attended the Anglican church nearby were moved to another Catholic church nearby, both communities felt a genuine sense of loss of their spiritual home. Nonetheless, it was about establishing and making a success of the mass for the LGBT community. And so many of us embraced it, embraced it uh, while others just left. I remember writing a rather plaintive article at the time saying, where art thou brother? Because so many people had left. Several years down the road, after many complaints and protests about the mass but from the right-wing pro-ecclesia, the pontificate, uh, the mass was moved to up market Mayfair under the tutelage of the current Cardinal Vincent Nichols and with the welcome of the Jesuits at Farm Street Church. And many years later, there it remains with the support of the Cardinal uh, Vincent Nichols. And it is the diocesan provision for LGBT people, their families and friends. This is where LGBT from far and wide would come to attend this mass, as it was the only mass, LGBT mass in England at the time. Parents would come with their gay son or daughter. Some same-sex couples would come with their children. The trans community, the women's groups, were also very visible there. Yet, and yet, the sense of belonging was just not there for many individuals. Some came and then left and never returned. Those who remained were those who could identify with the strong presence of white gay men there. This is perhaps a, a case of the usual, for me, sad human condition of birds with a feather flocking together. So what is it that happens when groups are created that end up with men being the dominant group there? What is it that makes women disappear and never appear in those spaces? And why are women not visible in LGBT plus leadership roles? And why are women not visible in LGBT groups? The core issues for me are about how easily the marginalized can marginalize those marginalized in their very groups. How patriarchy continues to manifest itself in LGBT spaces. How misogyny and racism subtly and overtly impact relationships between gay men and women. And how in all the LGBT groups that I'm involved, the continual challenge for me is to get the majority, the men, to understand that we have to recognize, accept, embrace, and live out the diversity of our ever expanding alphabet soup of LGBTQIA plus plus plus. Now, my sadness is that in my many decades of living in the West, the only time I have felt an outsider was within the LGBT plus faith community. And nothing to do with racism, at least I was never acutely aware of it, maybe some uh, marginal senses of it, but more to do with the misogyny and entrenched notions of patriarchy that was prevalent. Many gay men of faith have embraced those patriarchal structures of the church and emulate those notions of patronage and inclusion. So if you're different or the outsider, whether a refugee, a homeless person, a foreigner, or a woman of color, then you can come in to listen to what they are saying. Just toe that line and don't have ideas above your station 
by making demands about your specific needs. The LGBT community is invariably set by men, men who are most likely influenced by familial notions of patriarchy of children, who see men as, oh, see, sorry, who see women as less important in the public sphere, who enter the world of gay men where male authority is promoted and embedded in art, culture, sexual mores, and where their persecution by civil society and religious texts seem to give them an entitlement over and above gay women, who in their eyes were seemingly let off the hook of persecution, because we never suffered or were not persecuted for our sexuality and were never penalized or not condemned in the Bible, unless of course you were a prostitute. Yet, you do have to ask who put and kept women in the domestic sphere made them invisible, forced them to remain subservient. For any woman daring to have a voice, an opinion, or who challenged the male status quo was to be condemned a witch and to inevitably meet their end at the stake. So who manufactured and enforced those uh, uh, notions of invisibility for women, especially for gay women? For sure, it wasn't the women who did that. Now, perhaps it's this attitude that permeates some men's gay attitudes towards gay women, who in their eyes didn't suffer the injustices that they endured. Well, as we readily know, women, straight or not, have always suffered and been subjugated at the expense of men's authority, of their own sense of authority, and for their attachment to power structures that have always best served men's interests. And here it is important to know that it is men who will always, well, or not always, have been the oppressors of men and women. So for me, it's not a case of who has oppressed more, but a case for the oppressed, the men, the women, to form alliances to stop the continued cycle of oppression invariably perpetuated by men. Now, not for a minute do I deny that women cannot and do not oppress. But call me old fashioned, call me a dreamer. But I do fundamentally believe in the joy and wonder of each person God created. So can we not just spend time to find things that we have in common with each other and not focus on what separates us? We all collectively and individually have so much to learn and gain from each other. And surely the difficulties, the challenges we face as gay people should galvanize us to be a dynamic and empowering force that creates common good. And at the same time allows space and time for our own individual uniqueness. It can only be through navigating these difficult paths and those challenges that we have in conversations from others that we can learn and grow as individuals and have respect and welcome diversity. You know that old age finger pointing out the faults and excesses of the other? Just leave three pointing back at us about our own inadequacies and faults. Learning to hear uncomfortable truths about our poor judgment, bad behaviors, sloppy self-perceptions about our perfect gayness need to be replaced by a grown-up, more mature and realistic understanding of what it is to be slightly less indulgent, slightly less inward-looking, less hedonistic, and to become a much more outward-looking inclusive, kind, and welcoming member of the LGBT plus community and of society as a whole. We need to try and follow the path that Jesus so clearly showed us all those years ago. It is not an easy path and certainly suffering fools or people who perceive malcontent in their hearts 
is just part of that landscape. Finding ways to disarm others through common civility, justice, equality, and a ditching of our preciousness has got to be what justifies that end game, which has to be about equality and inclusivity for all. Now, for that to happen, those in positions of power and privilege need to step into the spaces of the less privileged and the more marginalized to experience and appreciate how we all fail, all of us as a community of LGBT siblings. Only through stepping out of our comfort zones and into those difficult spaces can we then begin to understand, appreciate, and create true equality and diversity in our LGBTQIA plus, 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 plus communities. So I'm gonna leave you with a few questions. How do we recognize equality? How do we challenge inequality? And how do we ensure that the organizations that we're engaged with are fully inclusive and welcoming of all diversity from our communities. Thank you.